It was the autumn of 1939, October 14th. The HMS Royal Oak was anchored at Scapa Flow. She was a British battleship nicknamed the Mighty Oak, a veteran of World War I and the mighty pride of Royal Navy. The base at Scapa Flow was near ideal anchorage and many considered it impenetrable. In the darkness of the night, on the 13th of October 1939, German submarine U-47 surfaced in Scapa Flow and crept slowly towards HMS Royal Oak. When the submarine was close enough, the commander of the U-boat, Gunther Prien, had given orders to fire torpedoes. The battleship had no chance in this duel and very quickly started to sink. 833 men, including Rear Admiral Henry Blagrove, died on board HMS Royal Oak. U-47 had crept out of Scapa Flow unnoticed. This attack had caused great confusion among the British, as sinking of a mighty warship in a base considered secure and impenetrable was a big shock to Admiralty. It was a disaster, and a big blow to the Royal Navy's reputation. Prien's success was a gift to the Nazi propaganda, and the whole crew of U-47 became heroes in Germany. This is the story of this daring mission. On Sunday, the 3rd of September, 1939, Great Britain had declared war on Nazi Germany. A few hours later, Fritz Julius Lemp, the commander of U-30, had made a ghastly mistake. His submarine had sunk a British liner, Athenia, carrying 1,418 passengers on board, of which 117 had lost their lives. It had been reported worldwide, and many considered it the beginning of a total war, unrestricted submarine warfare, where civilians become a target. When U-30 spotted a ship on the horizon, Fritz Julius Lemp decided to close the distance. Looking through the periscope, he observed that the ship was blacked out and zigzagging on a defensive course. Taking into account its unusual route, through Rockall Bank, Capital Lieutenant Lemp concluded it must have been a British armed merchant, a ship armed with guns. No warning is necessary under the prize regulations he ordered to fire torpedoes. While observing the sinking ship, U-30 had intercepted Athenia's distress call, SSS, attacked by the submarine. Lump asked for Lloyd's register of ships. He was shocked when he realized what he had done, but to make things worse, he also failed to offer any help and decided not to report what he'd done. He had chosen to remain silent. He must have known the possible consequences his actions would have on Germany. It was the first day of the war with Great Britain, and he had broken all the rules. The Nazis' first step was to deny responsibility. Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels issued a statement claiming it was a British torpedo that sunk Athenia and Churchill had planned this, hoping that he could bring the USA into the war. Hitler had almost immediately ordered tightening of restrictions on submarine operations. He had never shared the optimistic confidence in the U-boat of Admiral Karl Donitz's, who became the commander of submarines on 28th January, 1939. Karl Donitz was a very experienced commander. When World War I broke out, he was serving on the light cruiser SMS Breslau. In October 1916, following his request, he had been transferred to submarine forces, where he was serving on board U-39 and UC-25. On 5th September 1918, he had been given command of UB-68. She got sunk by British forces a month later, and Donitz was taken prisoner. He had been kept in prisoner of war camp near the city of Sheffield, and finally released in July 1918. After being released and coming back to Germany, he served on torpedo boat and the cruiser Emden. On 1st September 1933, he started a new chapter in his career when he was put in command of the first U-boat flotilla. When the war broke out, German surface fleet was no match for the British. Open war with Britain would be disastrous, and the Kriegsmarine would be unable to challenge the British supremacy at the seas. Karl Donitz was convinced that the only option for Germany was submarine warfare. 
Having served on U-boats himself, he was very familiar with their specific atmosphere, camaraderie, and life under the water. The majority of his commanders were young and ambitious men, encouraged by the chance of reaching a position of responsibility and the spirit of friendship amongst the crews. Many of the officers volunteered to join the U-boat arm. Due to the nature of the submarine service, the atmosphere was so different to the other forces, including even the surface fleet, the Kriegsmarine. The U-boats were spending weeks at the sea. As the men didn't shave or wear official uniforms, it became almost impossible to distinguish officers from ordinary sailors. The U-boat's crews became known as the Free Corps, Free Corps Donuts, the nickname that reflected their unity as most of the men were volunteers. It also referred to Free Corps, a group of men who volunteered to fight and protect Germany from communism after World War I. Karl Donitz was a very charismatic leader and he knew how to treat his people. For many of them, especially the younger ones, he was like a father, a person with authority, who was looking after his men and knew almost every one by name. At the same time, Hitler and the Nazis were becoming more and more powerful. On 17th March 1938, Austria was annexed into the Third Reich. Six months later, the Prime Ministers of France and Great Britain cowardly signed the Munich Agreement, permitting the Nazis to occupy Czechoslovakia's land, known as Sudetenland. Allied governments were fearful of the new war and decided to avoid it at any cost. Neville Chamberlain gave his famous Peace for Our Time speech in front of crowds in London, and at the same time, Hitler had been given everything he wanted. After the war broke out, the first U-boat attacks were quite successful, but all the operations were overshadowed by the sinking of passenger liner Athenia by U-30. The incident sparked a furious reaction from Hitler, who still believed in the possibility of signing a peace treaty with Great Britain. Also, many of his commanders believed that the German surface fleet, the Kriegsmarine, was not prepared for war and it would be no match for the British or French. After careful analysis, Karl Donitz came to the conclusion that the only chance of success for Germany would be a total economic blockade of sea transport lanes. He believed the U-boats could be the decisive factor in the Battle of the Atlantic. Merchant ships and oil tankers were relatively easy prey and without oil and the supplies Royal Navy would be unable to fight, almost equivalent to sinking it. Donuts had started to plan an attack on Scapa Flow. This operation was not only meant to impress Hitler, but it would, as a consequence, lift the restrictions put on U-boats after the Athenia blunder. This mission would also have a symbolic meaning, as Scapa Flow was the place where the Imperial German Navy surrendered after World War I. On 21 June 1919, German Admiral Ludwig von Reuter ordered his fleet to scuttle. His order was followed immediately. Fifteen capital ships, five cruisers, and 32 destroyers were sunk, thus avoiding the German fleet being seized and divided amongst the Allies. Admiral Karl Donitz came up with a daring plan. He believed that it was possible to penetrate Scapa Flow, even though during World War I, U-boats had twice tried to break the anti-submarine defenses and on both occasions failed. He noted there was a route between block ships and after careful studies of reconnaissance data delivered by Luftwaffe, Donitz was convinced that his plan would work. There were many young, skilled U-boat commanders, but Donitz had decided to choose a short, plump-faced captain of U-47, Gunther Prien. When the young officer was approached by Donitz, the answer could only have been one. Prien did not hesitate, although he must have been aware. This was almost certainly a suicidal mission. No one had said it out loud, but they were not expected to survive. Coming back was not even mentioned. Prien was confident he could succeed. He did not disclose the objective of the mission, but the crew had complete confidence in their commander and never asked any questions. His U-47 had left Kiel Harbor on Sunday 8th of October. The journey lasted five days, with U-47 finally reaching its destination on 13th October. Although U-47 was able to travel at 17 knots on 31 kilometers per hour using its diesel engines, Prien had to be extremely cautious. He decided to use it only on the surface at nighttime, 
remaining submerged during the daytime. U-47 had traveled around the Denmark Peninsula into the North Sea. Prien ordered to surface on the evening of 12th October to confirm his position. The coastal lights remained lit and his U-47 was just off the Orkneys. At sunrise, at 4 a.m., he ordered to submerge, informing his crew that the following day they will make an attempt to enter Scapa Flow 12 hours later. After finishing dinner, which could have been their last one, the crew started to prepare the boat. Three men were ordered to place explosive charges to avoid seizing of the vessel and valuable Enigma device in case of the mission failure. The whole crew had checked their life jackets and they were ordered to rip the flotilla IDs off their caps. Chief Engineer Johann Frederick Wessels ordered to pump the ballast to the sea and the U-47 had moved to the periscope depth. Periscope up, Prien ordered. After ensuring it's safe to do so, he gave the next order. Surface. According to U-47 captain's log, the submarine surfaced on the moonless night at 7.15 p.m. Prien opened the hatch and the officers breathed fresh air. For a moment, the men observed Scapa flow and finally Prien ordered to move ahead. For a brief moment, he was considering aborting the mission. They weren't expecting what they had seen. The whole horizon was bright, lit by the colorful glow of the northern lights. The U-47 officers could see everything very clearly. Prien had been carefully steering his boat for the following hours. At one point, when he was maneuvering between the old hulks blocking the way, his boat had been caught by one of the cables keeping the blocking vessels in place. U-boat freed with difficulty rapidly maneuvering, and U-47 finally crept into Scapa Flow at 12.47. Suddenly, a crew on the bridge had spotted a car on the nearby shore. Its headlights swept the submarine and the men's blood run cold, as they were thinking they were spotted and would be fired at any second. But nothing had happened and U-47 continued silently west for 3.5 miles. The crew's mood started to change as the anchorage seemed to be empty. Prien had not been aware that most of the big ships had left the base by the 13th of October. The British had spotted a German reconnaissance plane flying over Scapa Flow. This could have been a sign of an incoming bomber raid, and a decision had been made for all the big ships to leave Scapa Flow, including battlecruiser Repulse and aircraft carrier Furious. The warships that had left before, mainly battleships Nelson and Rodney and battlecruiser Hood, were ordered to stay on the west coast of Scotland. Finally, one of the lookouts, Second Watch Officer, 2WO, Amelung von Verendorf, pointed out two big shadows to Prien. Looking through binoculars, he identified them as two battleships belonging to the Royal Oak class. After a longer observation, both warships were identified as Royal Oak herself and HMS Repulse. Prien was mistaken, as the second warship was actually a much smaller seaplane carrier the Pegasus. Prien smiled as he had finally found the prey he came for. There were a lot of anchored tankers, but he hadn't been doing it all just to sink a few small vessels. U-47 still remained on the surface when Prien ordered to go ahead slowly. After careful checks for cruisers and destroyers, he decided to commence an attack. When distance decreased to 3,000 meters, Prien ordered to flood torpedo tubes and open outer doors. Torpedo los, ordered Prien, and the first torpedo had been fired. U-47 rocked slightly, and the fired torpedoes accelerated to 30 knots and ran in silence towards the battleship. The watch in the conning tower counted seconds to explosion. Only the first torpedo hit the oak starboard, but Prien, seeing no explosion, assumed he hit the ship he mistakenly identified as Repulse. It was well known that torpedoes were not very reliable, so he ordered to fire the stern tube. He missed again, but he did not want to give up. Not now. He ordered to reload the bow tubes. Three torpedoes had been fired, and this time, all three had found their target. At 1.16 came the sound of the detonations. Over 2,400 tons of TNT exploded, and Prien, from his conning tower, 
observed columns of water, smoke, and flames, as Royal Oak had been hit in the cordite storage. All three had found their targets. Most of the crew on board Royal Oak were asleep. Although the first explosion shook the ship, no one was worried. It was thought it may have been an internal explosion, and no one ever thought about the possibility of a submarine attack. Prian had observed as the ship almost immediately began to list. The battleship lost electricity, and the cordite from the magazine had ignited. Within the next 13 minutes, the warship sunk completely, and at 129, it disappeared beneath the surface. The officers on U-47's conning tower knew that she was finished, and it was time to retreat. Prian had no reason to believe their presence had been detected, but he decided it was high time to start to move towards Kirk Sound. No one spotted the submarine, and by 2.15, Prian's boat had reached the open sea and sailed towards Wilhelmshaven. Hundreds of men were trapped between Royal Oak's decks. Those who managed to leave the ship found themselves in cold water, covered with a thick layer of ship fuel. The rescue lasted until early morning hours. Out of the 1,234 sailors, 833 were killed or died later of their wounds, including the Rear Admiral Henry Blagrove, commander of the 2nd Battle Squadron. The majority of the survivors were saved by the captain of a vessel, Daisy 2. John Gatt, whose crew rescued 386 men, including Royal Oak's commander, Captain William Benn. Initially, this attack had caused a lot of confusion amongst the British Admiralty. The initial reports confirmed a series of explosions and Captain Benn, the ship's commanding officer, was adamant the warship had been sunk by torpedoes. It had been decided to send divers to clear the doubt. Although the search had been interrupted by a destroyer who dropped depth charges on what the crew thought was a submerged submarine, the divers found the proof they were looking for, a torpedo's propeller. When the British were busy trying to seal the anchorage, Preen's U-47 was already on its way home to Wilhelmshaven. The official announcement took place on 14 October on the BBC, and Winston Churchill officially confirmed the loss of Royal Oak. He claimed that the sinking of the old battleship will not affect the overall situation, but privately he admitted it was a disaster, and he felt the loss. Home fleet was ordered to stay in other ports until the security was improved. The BBC broadcast had also reached Germany, and it became clear that U-47 succeeded sinking a battleship and safely crawled out of Scapa Flow. Donuts was ecstatic. Sinking a British battleship in the safety of its base was a humiliating blow to the Royal Navy. Churchill was right claiming that this will not change the overall naval situation, but the propaganda damage had been done, and it was disastrous. If a single U-boat was able to sink a battleship, what could a fleet do? Goebbels had launched a propaganda campaign, creating a myth of brave, lone wolf, to emphasize its crew's virtues. Prien was aware of what he had achieved, and it got confirmed when the BBC's broadcast had been received on board U-47. He deliberately delayed his arrival, ensuring that all Navy officials had enough time to arrive at Wilhelmshaven to greet them. When they had reached the port at 11.44 on 17 October, Commander-in-Chief of the German Army, Eric Rader himself, greeted them and awarded Prien with the Iron Cross First Class and the rest of the crew with the Iron Cross Second Class. When approaching Wilhelmshaven, the crew decorated the submarine's conning tower with the image of a charging bull. Prien very quickly got nicknamed the Bull of Scapa Flow, and even Adolf Hitler sent his private plane to fly the whole crew to Berlin to meet them personally. He awarded Prien the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, with Prien being the first submarine officer awarded with this decoration. He became a new German hero, with all newspapers and radios desperate to interview him. This was a great triumph for the German Navy, with the Kriegsmarine finally banishing ghosts of German fleet failure in World War I. It also resulted in Hitler lifting all restrictions imposed on the U-boat arm after the Athenia disaster. For the first time ever, the Germans started to think that the Royal Navy can be defeated. Sinking Royal Oak did not change the naval situation, but made the Germans believe the war on the seas could be won. Karl Donitz was also promoted from Commodore to Rear Admiral. 